Hey, Jim Toscano here, and welcome to Filling in the Grooves, the Monday night live stream. And uh, tonight I have a really special guest that I'm going to bring in very shortly. Before I do that, I just want to thank uh, some companies that have been really supportive of what I do. Uh, ProLogix Percussion, Offset Pedals, Sabian Cymbals, and Black Magic Designs. And um, man, tonight uh, tonight is an extra special night, I think. And I have... Um, I have an amazing guest on who almost needs no introduction. Like once you hear his name, you're going to know a bunch of hits that this man's played on. And, um, and I have some funny little conversations that I've had with other drummers this week about, about my guest tonight. And um, he's a, a super wonderful human, really warm person and really humble. Um, but he shouldn't be because he's got this crazy lit. I'm going to just read you a couple of the hits that this man has played on. And and this is from when I did a I did a little tribute show back um almost a year ago now I think uh going through some of the drum parts. And uh so Lean on Me, Use Me, Got to Find My Baby, Good Vibrations, Dancing Machine, which we broke down in detail that night. Um I Want You, Love Hangover, Got to Be Real. Uh he's played with everybody from Bill Withers to Beck Justin Timberlake, just like a couple of years ago. This man is keeping super busy, too. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. James Gadsden. So how are you doing, man? Well, hey, man, I'm still here. You know, I'm still here. I'm a, a senior citizen, very senior citizen. And, uh, you know, I'm still uh, excited about playing. You're still, still doing it. You're still inspiring everybody. And uh, and you just told me that yesterday you were practicing like all day, right? You were practicing yeah. real hard yesterday. So right. how do you still get the the inspiration to keep working so hard, man? Well, I mean, I'm not as work. I'm not doing as much as I was, but I mean, I like to practice. And uh, I, you know, it's so much out there now that it it wasn't at one time. I like a lot of the old school stuff. It's still great as well as the new school stuff, as they call it. And so, you know, I'll try to practice on whatever I can practice on. Yesterday I was practicing on a lot of the uh, rhythms from a lot of the old school records that they made because the foot patterns were much busier yeah, yeah. than the, you know. So, you know, I'm just, hey, you know, just going through it. Yeah, man. You know? Well, I have, I have a little... Um, I have some clips to play and the, these are video clips. And so you're not going to see the video, but you're going to hear the voices. Um, our guests are going to hear the video. Um, our, the people that are attending and watching this, this stream, but I'm going to send you all the videos, but I want you to hear these messages that I have pre-recorded for you. <laughs> so um, the first one, here we go. Hey everybody. David Garibaldi here on the West Coast. And uh, I guess you guys are going to be hanging out with James Gadsden tonight. So uh, anyway, my it's going to be great. James is like one of my very, very favorite players. Uh, beautiful man and very historic, you know, in this drum thing that we do. And so um, ask him a lot of questions. Some good, get, get them some good questions. Have them talk about uh, Jackson 5, you know, Dancing Machine. How about that? Dyke and the Blazers, all that stuff. James, you're beautiful, man. I love you. And uh, keep it going, man. You're the, absolutely the very, very best. Wow. Shuffles. You can talk about shuffles tonight. <laughs> yeah. All right, brother. You guys have fun. Bye-bye. Wow, that's great. <laughs> so, wow, thank you. David sent me that video, and... um. And the last thing he said on that was like, shuffles. You guys could talk about shuffles. Because <laughs> yesterday, yeah. yesterday, I just want to, real quick, I had him on, on the phone while I was on the phone with you. And he said that he saw you playing, I forget what year he said it was, but he said that you had the nastiest shuffle going down. And, um, and he said, make sure you talk about shuffles. So we'll, we'll definitely get to that. Um, oh, yeah, he said a couple of guys asked... Uh, Johnson. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, here we go. Congrats. He said, um, seeing him live was so badass. A shuffle like you've never heard. 
what time is the show? And he's going to be here tonight. So that's cool. Um, I have another message for you. And do you know Ralph Roll? So Ralph Roll is the drummer with Sheik and Nile Rodgers. And um, he has a message for you. Wow. Mr. Gatson, uh, thank you for the many, many decades of incredible groove and instruction that you've given so many drummers around the world, me being one of them. Um, I've admired your work and uh, your ability to bring so much to a, a song. Um, I, I wish that I had a chance to meet you one day uh, just to be able to shake your hand and tell you how thankful I am that you have been such an inspiration to this world. And um, I know for decades to come, you will still remain one of the most incredible influences uh, behind a drum set. So thank you so much. Wow, how nice. Yeah. How nice. But we do get to meet and shake hands. Yeah, yeah, wow. for sure, man. Ralph is <laughs> Ralph is a sweetheart of a guy, and, and he brought you up in when I interviewed him as one of his influences big influences man so i wanted to share that with you i have a few of these i'm going to play a couple more and then we're going to talk and then i'll save a couple for later um here's one from our good buddy don famulero jim toscano's filling in the grooves with james gatson james gatson is a hero of mine when it comes to groove and playing pocket this is the standard of what we all should guide by he is absolute drumming royalty. Thank you so much, James Gatson, for all you continue to do. I love you so much. Thanks. <laughs> wow, I love you too. It's good to hear your voice. Wow. Dom Great. Is, Dom is one of a kind, right? <laughs> yes, he so wow. So I'm gonna play some more of those messages in a little bit, but I, I have some I have some questions. We gotta dig into it a little bit before we do that. So um I just wanted to mention that, you know, I, I mentioned that in twenty nineteen you recorded with Justin Timberlake and I'm starting now and then we're going to work back. And so over the last few years, and, and I also um, mentioned that you played with Beck um, and some of these uh, newer recordings that you've worked on. Um, tell me about that. How is it working with, with these pop guys now compared to when you were starting to, to work in the earlier days and coming up? What is it like? What's that experience for you? Well, I mean, it's all exciting to me. I, I, I never take, I take it all uh, very seriously. And uh, it's a lot of learning, you know, a lot of different techniques and uh, ways that, you know, the, that they're writing and doing their music. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a great, it's a great challenge. It's a great challenge. I, 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 I'm in awe that they even call me and, uh, I'm grateful to be there, you know. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I will say, you know, back to back on that album Sea Change, a lot of the stuff that you played is really, of course, playing for the song um, and sitting the groove just in the, in the right spot, sitting the backbeat just in the right spot, and, and real dry, like the drums sound really dry, the way Beck recorded his record. And um, what was that experience like working with him? Because he's... An interesting producer, right? Yes, he is. Uh, he and uh, Nigel Goodridge was uh, were producing. What ex what an experience I had! You know that was great. I mean, so many we tried so many different things, and the way that uh, the drums were mic'd, the ones that I was using, uh, I used the drums that I used in the seventies. You know, the disco drums. Oh, cool had all the heads off of them and uh th they were able to control that sound they like it but nigel uh mics the drums much different than they usually are mics you know so it was it was great and uh going playing sea change because beck was going through um something in his life and uh it was very it was you know it was like we were on a journey you know, we were really on a journey. It was really uh, some, it was, it would get really, uh, I mean, it would be, I uh, couldn't really explain it, but I mean, it would be 
like a, like we in a drone sometimes. Wow. You know, we been to it, you know. It was it was something. Yeah, yeah. And um I mean that record, you know, for I I loved when I when I did my show about you and I was I was kind of breaking down grooves. I was listening to all these different things that you played on and and some of these things I never realized you had played on. Um <laughs> But because the classics, of course, we all know, and they've been covered in a ton of books. And I wanted to mention real quick. I know I told you this before, but um, give the drummer some. My my buddy Jim Payne's book. He did a wonderful tribute to you in this book. There's there's a, a few pages going through it, and um, of course Stanton Moore did a tribute in Groove Alchemy to you. <laughs> there's a tribute wow. in um, my buddy um, Mike Adamo's Breakbeat Bible. You're in here. Wow. There's there's a wonderful tribute. Of course, the commandments of R and B drumming with Zorro. There's a tribute to your wow. playing in there. And so, you know, the the uh the level of respect is just unbelievable and rightly so. And um and it's so great to speak with you about these uh these grooves. Let's um let's talk about playing with Paul McCartney. So what was that like? Oh man, I mean I was uh I, I I didn't believe it at first when um, Nigel was producing him and told me that it, that was going to happen. I, I didn't believe it. I mean, you know, I was uh, beside myself. You know, <laughs> it was, it was um, you know, wow, what can I say? But Paul, Paul was so very eloquent and so nice when I worked with him. Um, and I, I had a lot of questions about the songs that they had written and he had written and the songs that they had performed and played. And, uh, you know, about, you know, Little Richard, they were they worked for him at one time and all these different. I asked him so many different questions. He was so nice that he answered everything. Oh, you know, he was really cool about that. You know, so, I mean, it was it was wonderful. And he's he's a drummer I mean, himself. He, yeah. he he can play, right? So, um, oh man, the hell man! You know he was uh, he was uh, uh, played the Jamaican. He can play that reggae and that ska too. I mean, you know, he played in the Jamaican script club. You know, <laughs> right, right. So, you know, yeah, he he yeah. So for me, because he usually does his drumming on the album, right? On his, you know, so it was an honor for me to be on that. You know. And was was there much direction, or is pretty much play, do well? You... Well, in a way of speaking, you know, I mean, he was very nice about me. Uh, what approach that I would have? Yeah, yeah. He was pretty nice about that. Ah, uh, cool. Yeah, you and, know, you know, I mentioned those records because you know a lot of people will know you know you from the sixteenth note funky feel of like sort of the Bill Withers age stuff. And it's a departure from that stuff, you know, hearing you on these other records. And I love that. Um, right. One other record I want to mention that always blows me away hearing you, this track of you is um, Donald Fagan's um, IGY. Oh, yeah, that was a... Oh, my God. That was a uh, experience. I mean, I was the only one. When I did that, I, when I did IGY and Ruby Baby, I was the only one there. Wow. You know, I mean, uh, I think what happened was they uh, had called me to do three weeks of sessions, and at the last minute they decided to use Jeff Carroll. And people do that. You know, producers, have, they have their own way. And so I guess they gave me uh, a session. And uh, I went in, and uh, I wasn't there. I wasn't, I wasn't there two hours. Wow. You know, and that's saying a lot for uh you know fagan and uh, them because they usually cut you know they take they're very meticulous about the drum sounds yeah 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 and so uh they put up the music and um i played and um uh, you know when i got home jeff called me he said man can i because he was coming in and he said man goes, we were very good friends can I use your tom? I said, yeah, man, go ahead. It's it's all good. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know. Man, so, I, yeah. And I would say as much as I love Picaro's Shuffles, 
Um, I don't think I'd want to hear anybody else on that song because the way that you made everything sit and it's it's kind of like what you didn't play made that song so hip. There's a, there's a few times where you um, you're just dropping out the downbeat on the bass drum. You hit that that you know that anticipation. Right. It just made it sit so well. If if anybody listening doesn't know the tune IGY or never paid attention to it that closely, go listen to what James did on that song. It's really really um, beautifully played. I think. Um, well, you know, it was great to play it because they did they did write that out. You know, they wrote that out. So it was it was not one of my creations. I was just glad to be able to perform it. <laughs> to gotcha. make it like that, you know. Yeah. You know. Oh, nice man. Um before we uh before I ask any more questions, I'm gonna play you another little tribute that came in for you. Um here we go. Hey James, Daniel Glass here coming to you from Times Square, New York City. I'm rushing to a rehearsal right now, but I just want to say it's great to uh, have you on Jim's show. And I cannot express in words just how much your groove and what you have brought to our instrument and to the music of America and to the world uh, has, has set the tone for everything that we all do today as drummers. Uh, you know, starting with Charles Wright, 103rd Street Watts Rhythm Band, and John Handy, Hard Work, which I use with every one of my students every day as a template for what groove and feel is all about. To uh, the Bill Withers stuff, Ridiculous, to all the disco era stuff, to everything you do, man, and people don't even realize what a badass singer you are as well. <laughs> so I'm just blessed and so grateful that I've had a chance to meet you the few times I have to uh, revel in your, in your groove and in your great energy. And I wish you nothing but the best, my friend. Peace. Take care. Peace to you and thank you so much. Man, it's been a, a wonderful journey to be able to play all those different types of music. You know, that's, it's a blessing. Truly, I, mean, I, I praise God Almighty for giving me the uh direction to do that that you know it's been it's i have nothing like to say about that. it's been wonderful you know for me to be able to do that yeah man and uh and daniel glass just mentioned about you singing and i was definitely going to get to that but let me ask you about that now so you kind of started out as a doo-wop singer maybe a lot of people don't know that um, right and and you had um as a young kid you had a record yeah, when I was 14. The Carpets, yeah. Right, I was. we had a group, my brother and I, and three more gentlemen in Kansas City. Uh, we, were, we, we got signed to the federal label. That was the same label that James Brown was on. Yeah. And that's when he first got, I think it was, it might have been almost the same time that he got signed. And he, he had a record out called, called uh, Why Do You Do Me This Way? That's be, that was before Please, Please, Please. Yeah. You know. And, um, you know, so we had a record out called Why Do I and Let Her Go. And, you know, we, had, we well, we done four sides. We didn't get to do a, a, an album. But uh, it was, you know, my mother wouldn't let me go. I, we were so young, my mother, which, which was good. My mother wouldn't let us go on the road. Right, right. And I think the thing now that I see it, I mean, I wasn't happy about it at all then, but, you know, now I see it, you know. Yeah. And the records, like, they did great. They were regional, but they didn't make a lot of noise, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you still have original pressings? Yes, I do. Oh, wow. I have those, yes. Oh, that's amazing. And um, right. And so kind of starting out as a singer, and then, it, you know, you mentioned that your dad, your dad was a drummer, right? And he didn't yes, want you to be a drummer. He didn't want you to be a musician. But he did not want to be in the music business. And he did not want, you know, especially being a drummer. In fact, he wouldn't let me, you know, I couldn't play his stuff or touch his stuff unless I moved it out of the way or something. <laughs> you know, but for me to, you know, be, you know, he didn't have such a great time, I guess, in, in the in the music business. So he bought me a cornet. You know, that's a um a trumpet, I guess, for uh, our orchestra or something, you know. And uh, I didn't have this tooth. I got a gold tooth now. So it was hard for me to play those notes, oh. you know. 
Now we, we played the Washington Post marches and the different marches. But um, I I just didn't I didn't um, I didn't want to play it. So you know I I, I went start I started ditching class and singing the doo wop stuff with the guys and yeah. drinking the wine. So it, 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 you know I wasn't cool. Gotcha. You know. And your brother also played cornet. Yeah, he played cornet. Yeah, he too. Was. He played, but he I don't think he was as good as I was. <laughs> so your dad was like, "Okay, you guys are gonna play cornet. You're gonna play in the drum, and, drum and bugle corps." And he was trying his his hardest to keep you out of the music business, sort of in that way, right? Yeah, I think that that was uh, just to have something to do to go to school. He didn't really want us in that business, you know. Yeah, yeah. My brother later on became a guitarist, and um, you know he uh, was a very good regional guitarist because, like a lot of the stacks action. Action down south would come to the Midwest, and he would they would use his band all around the Midwest. You know, uh, this was after, before, and after I joined this group because I had no idea that he had a band, and I didn't. In fact, I didn't even start playing a set of drums until I was twenty one years old. I could play street beat marches, wow. and you know, marching rhythms and stuff of that nature. But when I got out of the Air Force and he had me to join his band, I was playing at the piano, you know, and dancing and, you know, a little Richard stuff, doing all that kind of stuff. And um, the uh, bass player left the group and the drummer could play bass and he didn't want to play drums anymore. So that left me with the drums. So my brother said, if you want to be in this group, uh, you know, you got to learn how to do this. And I didn't want to, you know, work at the post office or, yeah, yeah. or anything like that. So I, I tried to get it together. You know, so, you know, that's that's how that worked out. That's kind of how it all started then. So were were you, you know, when when you were younger, you your dad didn't want you touching his stuff. By the time you were 21 and you were out of the Air Force, were his drums were already gone? Like the drums? Well, uh, we we had we were uh, we didn't really live. He had stopped playing. His health had gotten really bad and he didn't have his drums anymore. Got it. So, um. He, uh, I think he might have, I think he might have got to see me play. I don't know if he had ever got to see me play any drums or not. Oh, okay. I think I was working in one of the nightclubs in Kansas City, and uh, one of the nightclub owners who knew him probably had him to come over and see me. I didn't know anything about it, you know, at the time. But I was just starting out, and and and, and during that time, I had come off the road from playing with my brother, who was playing. We were playing. R and B, they called it rock and roll then, rhythm and blues. Now it has so many different names. <clears throat> that I got dazzled by the uh, Hammond B three organ. So if he saw me play, he probably saw me playing with the Hammond B three organ. I and I got into the jazz. Uh, I am, you know, that and, and you know playing outside jazz and stuff of that nature. Wow. So that's that's what I was doing. Uh, until I left Kansas City. Okay. Um, and then, so in when you were when you were touring with your brother, when you were playing with him, and um, so you guys were playing shows, playing gigs. What kind of stuff was that original material, or were you playing standards of the time? Or uh, well, it was you know this was a different. While we were in town, I uh, worked around the Midwestern areas. We played some. We played the uh, top forty stuff and some originals. But we had gotten a booking to go down south, and uh, his, my brother's mother-in-law knew this promoter, and he had us, you know, he booked us down south. That was a hard, it was horrific. It was awful. I mean, he booked us as Otis Redding, who was living at that time, and oh. William Bell, and all these people, and we had to go in these different towns and portray these people and uh, they would actually be shooting at us we had they'd run us out of town a lot of times it was pretty rough you know i I read about this yeah yeah so he was booking you as like these people and then when the crowd would get there it wouldn't be otis redding and they were mad right yeah sometimes it worked but most of the times it didn't (laughs) oh my god i don't think we ever got paid oh my god you know it was really it was really uh 
it was horrible. It was pretty rough. But I, I stayed, you know, when uh, we, the last show was in Miami, Florida. And I stayed. Uh, my brothers went back. To, my brother went back to Kansas City. And I stayed in Miami because there was so much going on then. I mean, I got to see Count Basie and Duke Ellington and all the R&B people. Oh, my God. You know, I, you know, I said, man, this was, this was exciting to me. So I stayed down there. And um, I'd get a, 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 a gig every so often. You know, uh, at that time, it was a segregated. So out on the beach, as they call it, was a good gig. And so a lot of the guys that were in the different bands, if they got a gig out on the beach, I would sub for them. Oh, wow. And he came through for Hank Ballard and the Midnighters. This guy was the originator of the twist. Right. Well, they had a more, they was more risque than Prince. I mean, this, <laughs> you know, it was a. Um, I, I enjoyed it, and it was a very uh, learning experience for me to be out there with them. And, uh, you know, that's where I, I did the first uh, – it was like my first professional gig with a name yeah. artist, you know. And we went to Nassau, Bahamas, and uh, that was rough because some lady thought that I had impregnated <laughs> oh my God. three over there. So I couldn't go nowhere by myself. You know, it was very dangerous. So I was – I was I, I got to hear on Sundays I got to hear the uh the music that they played over there, which was great. And, but I had to be with somebody wherever I went. So I was so glad to get away from there. Oh my god. You know. Um, oh, it was awful. It was awful. <laughs> I mean the guy I passed by if I was going somewhere, I can't remember a lot. I remember, remember going to the show and getting pushed out of line. Oh. I remember walking past the pool hall and getting pool balls so at me. Oh my God! So whoever this guy was, <clears throat> whoever he was, you know he—they didn't like him at all, and they thought it was me. So I mean, I got his—he uh, <laughs> took it out on me. He was pretty rough. <laughs> oh my God! All right, I got—I got to play one more little tribute. One second. Here's my okay. good buddy Stanton. Hello, I want to give a shout out to Mr. James Gadson. James, yes. you mean the world to so many of us drummers. I don't know if you know this, but we love you, and we all talk about you, and everybody considers you to be the gold standard for right-handed 16th notes. And we all talk about how we aspire to make our 16th notes feel as good as yours. You're a legend, and I can't express how much you mean to the drumming community. Thank you, my man. And I'll be watching tonight. It's a D. Thank you, Stanton. Wow, man. <laughs> Great uh, to hear your voice. Wow. Yeah, man. Stanton, um, you know, talking about 16th notes, um, he's, he broke down um, Kissing My Love in, uh, in Groove Alchemy. And when I did the show about your drumming, that is a one beast of a tune to keep that feel at that specific tempo moving with that kind of forward momentum is tricky it's really tricky man and um and to make it feel that good so how did how did you develop that for that particular tune and and with that kind of intensity and i've watched the video of you playing it and it's just it's just really wonderful to see but well you know it didn't start out the song was like a shuffle at first. It didn't start out to be like that. For some reason or another, it wasn't working. And uh, eventually, that was the last song of the day that I did, that we did, you know, that, when I was with Bill Withers. So I came up with that. I don't know how it happened. I don't, it just, you know, I was trying to, like I had a 16th note shuffle like going. On. And uh, tick, bop, bop, the boom, the bop, boom, 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 the bop. To pop up, you know, I just, you know, it just came up like that. And, um, you know, it worked. Yeah, 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 it worked. Um, man, it's... I had to refine it after that. I had to learn how to play it, you know, because it came up, you oh, know. Oh, my goodness. Um, I was, I was about to, like, just try to pull up the track, but, um... Maybe I'll try to do that later. They'll probably take down my video if I do that. Um, <laughs> but um, man, it's it's such um, the 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 momentum in the in the hand, and then the funkiness of it. And it's got this certain lope, and there still is a lot of swing to that groove, even though 
as you say, it started out as a shuffle. It got, a, it got straighter, but it has a certain lope to it in that swing. And, um, yeah, it's, it's tricky to play, man. Um, it's definitely every, every drum student should work on that. <laughs> you definitely set a standard with that one. I'm going to pull up um, the chat window for a second because uh, there's a lot of people saying hi, and I think we should just really quickly grab a few of these people. So Stanton Moore was the first one in here. He said that um, he said hello to you, and he had the pleasure of meeting you when he came um, when you came to hear him at the Mint in uh, Los Angeles. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he said that you're such a gentleman and what a legendary player. And he said that when he shook your hand, he thought to himself, he just shook the hand that plays the best feeling 16th notes of all time. <laughs> so, wow. And um, my buddy Gary Weiss is in here and he says, he's saying hi. And he actually played with Gloria Gaynor um, as well. And so that's pretty cool. And, um, and let's see, Bob Sears up in New Hampshire saying hi. Um, Lucia, one of my young students from uh, New York here, says hi. Don O'Keefe is saying hi. Um, let's see who else is in the chat real quick and if there's any questions. Don Familaro is in the chat. He said this is so great. He was honored to interview you for the Sessions panel, uh, which we all know that was amazing. Um, the Sessions panel interviews are incredible, but your episode, which is two, two episodes, uh, part one and part two, is really amazing. Anybody that's not seen that, go check out James Gadsden's interview with uh, the sessions. Really awesome. And um, let's see who else. AK, I'm trying to remember who that is. Michael Rosillo is in here. Peter Retzlaff, great drummer from New York, is in here. Uh, Joey Pinto saying hello. Brian Dunn saying hello. What? And uh, Brian's got a message for you, actually, real quick. I'm going to play that one now. Mr. James Gadsden. I'm sure you have no idea who I am. Um, I know who you are. Uh, my name is Brian Dunn. I've been the drummer for uh, uh, the Hall of Oates Cake, Daryl Hall and John Oates, for maybe the last 11 years wow. or so. Wow, man, I watched you on uh, TV. I just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, send you this message and thank you for all the inspiration you've given me and countless other musicians. Um, just unbelievable, man. You're a hero. Um, yeah, that's it. So, wow, thank uh, you. I watch you on nice YouTube all the time, man. Wow. Yeah, yeah, Brian Dunn, he's, he's a great drummer, and, um, and he cited you as an influence when he was on my show also. <laughs> so, um, I hope you don't mind that I got all these, um, quotes from folks, and that, I mean, um, uh, what can I say? I mean, this is, uh, to have people to appreciate you, man. I mean, that's a once in a lifetime thing. I mean, I'm so taken back. You know, I'm I'm happy about that. Uh, awesome. Um, and there's a there's actually one more, so I'll just do it right now before I get into the next question. So, uh, this is from our buddy Jim Payne. Hey, James Gadsden, man, it's amazing to be able to connect with you after a while here. Um, you know, thanks for your interview that you did with me for the uh, my book of the drummer song, but man. When I heard that tune, let a man be a man, let a woman be a woman, let a man be a man, you know. I heard all that syncopation going on, man. That was it, man. You really turned it upside down, man. I'm glad you did, you know. And thanks for uh, thanks for Jim Tuscano to making this thing happen, man. And I hope we can connect again soon, man. James Gadsden, you're the man. Wow, you're the man, Jim. <laughs> so... Coming from Jim in France today, he uh, he sent me that video. So, um, all right, now we can get, we can get back into the history, and um, and so um, we're gonna go back now. So, you played with your brother. You go to Miami, and um, and you're cutting your teeth doing these gigs. And so, what was the what was the next step after that? After um, after the gigs in Miami. Well, I I eventually get, I went back. I got tired of the. The road. I mean, we were traveling by station wagon. Oh, okay. I mean, you know, we were going from town to town, all across the United States, and then we'd go up and down. So a year, I was out there for a year, and um, I got tired of it. I mean, Hank Ballard wanted to take me to Motown because he would let me sing. He would let me open the show singing. He wanted to take me to Motown. He said he knew Barry Gordy very well, but I just couldn't hang that long. Oh. So 
I came, I came back home and I rejoined my brother's group. And uh, I didn't stay there too long. I uh, started working with a guy that, that my father had worked with. He was a guitar player. He was a mailman and a guitar player. And I started working with him as a duo. I had a cocktail set of drums. And um, that's how I learned a lot of the standards, standards that they, they call them standards, you know, um, which was a great experience for me, you know, and I had to sing a lot of the standards. And uh, I've stayed, I think it was maybe a, a year. And then I was able to uh, work with the organist guy by the name of Frank Edwards, who was a fantastic organist. And uh, we played a lot of swing. And people were dancing the swing then, too, in Kansas City, you know. Right, right. And we played, and then this during the time, this was Jimmy Smith was out with the Sherman and Jack McDuff was, you know, all these different people, uh, John Patterson, Larry Young. I mean, it was, you know, it was fantastic. So I was uh, playing with the, you know, the organ, B3 organ guys. And um, and then some outside jazz with, with some of the guys in, around town. And I got a call. At, and I was at this gig one night. I got a call one night from some friends of mine that were in Los Angeles. They were on. The, they told me, "Say, man, watch us." They were on the Dean Martin show. Wow! I thought they had made the big times. I said, "Oh, man!" I was so excited. They said, "Man, come on out." Oh man, I had to go. So I had just got married and had a child, and man, I we came to California, and I couldn't play. The R and B. I couldn't play no R and B or no pop R and B. I couldn't play that. I was a straight ahead guy. Right, right. So they, uh, they, they, they had to let me go. So I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, it was, it was, uh, man, I was heartbroken. And um, jobless, and uh, you know, I had, I had come to California. A couple of times playing, you know, the B3 organ, playing with the B3 organ guy, San Francisco and Los Angeles. And I met a guy by the name of John Boudreau, who was a famous drummer in New Orleans. He played on something you've gotten a lot of different uh, records, but he was also a jazz drummer. And I met him one night when I was out here and I kept his number and I happened to find his number when I, you know, I said, man, I'm starving to death. He said, well, man, I'll get you a gig. I'll get you a gig. Don't worry about it. So he got me a gig with Charles Wright at the time. This was later on the Watts 103rd Street Rhythm Band. Right. And uh, it was $12 a night, man. I And $12 was great for me, man. I had, of course, man, I was making $750 a week in Kansas City. So $12, you know, and I'd get, I had to get on the bus sometimes to make this gig, you know, with my drums. And so it was on Thursday in the street. The strip club and the strippers walls. Wow. So he fired me about five times. <laughs> you know, because I could I hey, I couldn't play no R and B. Wow. So he finally said, Man, if you want to gig, you got it, but just play time. Just play time. So I had to play fours on the the hi hat, fours on the kick drum and fours on the snare. That was the hardest thing in the world for me to do at that time. I mean, I man, that was Cause I had been so busy and creative. I mean, you know, right, that right. was, man, I mean, it was, but I knew I had to work, yeah. you know, so I did that for about eight months <laughs> and I started to, uh, understanding the R and B stuff, you know, and uh, I know Motown at that time, there was a lot of force, you know, and I didn't know they had two drummers. Right. You know, at that time. So, but it, so it was a lot, you know, they were, Sometimes it sounded like they were playing fours. It just it was different, you know. I just knew the feels were so even. I said, man, I don't know how, how they can do that, you know. But that's what they were, you know, it was two drummers. But anyway, I started to listening to everybody. Yeah. Motown and Stax and a lot of East Coast stuff. And, you know, at, the, at that time, in different parts of the country, you had different, uh, you know, Washington, D.C., uh, Carolina, a lot of the different regions, uh, it was a different drummers. Drummers played different, yeah. and you know, so 
you got to hear all these different styles. Now, you know, today it's a lot of drum machine stuff. But, I mean, you got to hear a lot of these different styles. And so I was able to understand that. And from listening to that, I, would, I came up with a creation of my own, you know. And um, I think the first record that I made was called Funky Walk. It was by Dyke and the Blazers. And it, right. it was a hit. And I was trying to mimic James Brown's drummer. Uh, so it, it worked, and uh, the guy said, "Well, hey man, uh, this is great. You know, we, we want to use we want to use you to, again." And by that time, I had joined the Watson on the Third Street Band, right. but we didn't have any hits yet. So the, the rhythm section, we were doing Dyke and the Blazers. So like he liked uh, the gentleman was talking about let a woman be a woman and a man be a man. That was another creation. That's the that was the way I felt it. Yeah, and. Um, you know, we we did We Got More Soul and Funky Walk. I mean, it was different, you know. Um, you know, running, I can't, I can't remember a lot of that stuff, but it was good for me because I got to create. I wasn't told what to play. I was just told to try to make it work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how that, that's how that started, you know. So going from playing four on the snare, four on the hat, four on the kick for, right. for all that time. And now you're getting to be creative and come up with your own lens, like from going right. through all this different stuff. That's incredible. I understood, I understood, you know, I, I understood what R&B was supposed to be, you know, where, where before I didn't, because I might play, man, play this rhythm. I might play it for maybe a couple of bars and then that was it. I was gone. Yeah. You know, that, the cat say, oh, no, we can't, you can't do that. I mean, I've done some what they call scab dates, some dates, you know, re recording sessions that I did so bad that during that time that the guys didn't pay me and I didn't expect them to pay me, you know, cause <laughs> I, I, I did so bad, you know. So, but, you know, eventually I was able to, by the grace of God, get it together to where that worked out. Yeah. You yeah, know? yeah. And, and it's at that time um, when you were playing with Charles Wright, I mean, were you guys touring a whole lot? What was that? What was the? Well, we uh, worked with Bill Cosby. We, we would tour. We toured with him, and then we he he made it possible for us to get a a recording deal with uh, Warner Brothers. Oh. He was on Freeze, which was a subsidiary of Warner Brothers, Frank Sinatra's album, Frank Sinatra's label. Album. Right. Excuse me. So we were able to get a recording contract with Warner Brothers and um that's how that happened. So we uh we did a um promotional tour. Warner Brothers paid for it and then they signed when we came back they signed signed uh you know signed his own and um uh, I think the first major tour we did was we opened up for the group called the Temptations who were hot at that time. Yeah man. We opened up for them. Wow you know so, and I and I was singing. We had a hit record called "Love Land" that I was singing, and uh, so I was saying that people didn't know I was. It was me because they didn't see me. <laughs> right. The horns was in front of me, and they thought it was Charles because he was on the piano. He'd be moving his mouth and stuff, so they they didn't know it was him. You know, I mean, they thought it was him. You know, and so it was. It was. You know, hey, I. It, it was it was what it was i was glad to be working yeah at that and um you know i eventually i met bill withers through charles he was at charles's house i met bill withers and uh <coughs> when he did ain't no sunshine i mean um, that was, I didn't play on that. That yeah. was uh, a lot of people think that's you, but that's Al, Al Jackson Jr., you. right? That was Al Jackson. Yeah, <clears throat> Booker T. Jones uh, produced that album, you know, and right. so yeah, they probably thought it was me because they were saw they saw me playing it, right? But um, I eventually got with Bill, and um, he did "Ain't No Sunshine," and then Grandma's Hand. They put that out. And it was not a hit record. It was a great record, but it was not a hit record. And they were, meanwhile, they were looking for a producer for him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had, we had started working with him, the, the rhythm section, the watch 
100 Third Street Rhythm Band rhythm section. And um, he came over to my house, and, every, and, and uh, the rhythm section came over to my house in my garage. And the rest was history for him. You know, we got together, and hey, man, he didn't look back. Nice. You know, he had, a, you know, Sunshine was big, but I mean, after that, but, you know, use me and kissing my love, lean on me. And then, you know, he did lovely day. I didn't do that. And all those, you know, lovely day and right. the things that he did after the Watts band. But I mean, you know, it, it, that um, I think the time that we were with him really uh, cemented his career. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know, it records. You know, it's funny. You mentioned grandma's hands before that. That tune is, again, you know, another one where it's a real st- kind of straight thing really simple definitely playing for the song but you bring so much to that song even though it's it's a short tune too it's only like two minutes and 30 seconds and um and i think the whole intro is just your feet in that first verse yeah yeah that's his feet i think that that's more that's more that whole rhythm thing is him his feeling you know yeah yeah and then you come in and it's just four on the floor right and just didn't play I, i mean I played live, but I mean that was Al Jackson, on, the famous on Grandma's Jackson. Hands too. Oh, all right. That yeah, played that, you know. I played it on the road, so uh, it was great playing out there with him, you know. Because I another, you know, I, I got to experiment in my garage. So when when the records were successful and they took off, then I could play me out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, that was you know that was that was really something. Wow. And, um, I think he wanted to make a change to do some other stuff. And uh, I was blessed to be able to, you know, I was, I got hired to do a lot of Motown work. Yeah. You know, and um, Dancing Machine came up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. By the way, um, Dancing Machine... <laughs> It's that's a tricky tune. Were you were you reading that? That was all charted, or was that what what was happening? It was charted to a degree, right? I was I was I I, I didn't mention that I had hey I would come home every day when I started working with Motown and get in the books because I I couldn't read. I taught myself how to read. Yeah, I remember you saying that you were mostly self taught, right? Right. Yeah, and so. I was just getting ready. I could read a dotted quarter by the hats, bomb, bomb, dom, bomb, you know. And then I said, boom, 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 with my bass drum. Da, 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 da. What, 816, 816? And um, I said, uh oh, they're going to fire me today. <laughs> I would be in the studios a lot of times, and I would see guys that, you know, they would give them different parts and they couldn't cut it. They would, hey, they would get somebody else, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was surprised that they kept me that long because, man, I, I, I'm a lot of those sessions over there, I didn't do right at all, you know. <laughs> but uh, that day, Dancing Machine, the kept said, well, man, can you do that again? I was nervous as I could be, but, you know. And so he, I said, yes. He said, bam, bam. I said, boom, 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 bam, 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 bam. So I was so nervous. Bam, 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 da, da, da. I was doing bam, 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 bam. And they knew I was nervous. Guess they hold it, man. We cut the tape. Now play. Bum, bum. They had to stop and, you know, say, now look at the music and play it. So uh, we finally got that together. And then I was, I was in, yeah. you know, to say the least, I was in at Motown. And my, you know, eventually my reading got to where it was cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I did a lot of other, a lot of big hits over there for them, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, that one one other thing about that tune, yeah, that that bass drum fill is like the perfect setup, right, for those hits. And then some of the stuff that you did on the hi hat later in the tune, you know, because it's more of a uh, alternating sixteenth kind of thing. Um, right. There's some really cool little moments. I I transcribed the whole thing note for note because I I was just enamored with your approach. So was that pretty early for like? Had you done much of that before? Or is it on that t- like that tune is different, right? Than a lot of the things you had done. Right, I hadn't done much of that before. A lot of that was experimental. Yeah, that one and uh, 
uh, Smokey Robinson had just departed from the Miracles, and they had a song called Do It Baby. Right. That was a hit. And they had me to play 16 notes on it, but the way they had me to play them, I had never played like that. Yeah. So I, I, it, it was all experimental, you know, and I, I, had, you know, I said, I know I got to do this. I mean, I just, you know, I was nervous, but I had to, I had to pull it off, you know, and so a lot of it was nervous, you know, with probably the dance machine, probably that was just nervousness, yeah, you know. Yeah. Oh, man, yeah. but you definitely spawned like some, some of the groundwork for people, what they were going to play later with that. Definitely, you know, really, wow. really inspirational stuff. Um, real quick, I'm just going to pop into the chat because I don't want to forget people. People are saying hi, and I'm I'm ignoring them. So real quick, we got okay. um, of course Brian Dunn, who who left you that message before, um, the Hall and Oates drummer, good buddy of mine. Uh, he said, "Kiss my love." End of story. Um, Eddie Everett said, "How do you play your sixteenth note so fast? Can you demonstrate?" Um, because what was funny is I was mentioning "Kiss my love" before and how I could start out with that tune and I feel all right, and about a minute and a half in. It's like, yeah, it's rough to keep that forward momentum, man. Yeah, I, well, I have problems with it now, my because I haven't played it for so many years. Yeah, yeah. But it's a muscle. But the thing about it, it's not a trick. The thing about it is being relaxed. Yeah. Don't think about it. I mean, don't don't pressure. If yep. you put pressure on playing sixteen notes like that, you're going to get tired. Yeah, yeah. You just let the stick do the work. If you let the stick do the work, you know. That's that's what it is. Now, when I watch you on that live, the live footage of you doing it with Bill, um, it looked like you're you're pretty much using sort of this pumping motion, and your hand is really really relaxed, and it looks like the stick is basically just you you know, your movement yeah. is serving it, and the stick is along for the ride. Um, yeah, I'm, it's very you got to be very relaxed with that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I'm trying to do a shuffle sixteen note situation i was you know whatever whatever would come out you know what i'm saying yeah yeah make it righteous my buddy uh sergio Belotti, uh who's an instructor up at berkeley he's a great drummer too southpaw uh friend of mine is saying hi he said greetings oh, and respect oh i'm Boston. a southpaw too i just don't play like that that's right that's right We're, i'm a southpaw um got it. we got some lefties in here um let's see oh um Karen Fetter, um, good friend of mine, is saying she's pretty sure that Jerry Brown was talking about you at the show the other oh, night. Oh, Jerry, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, shout out to Jerry, yes. I, uh, good, you know, I, I got to meet Jerry, you know. When, I, I guess he still lives out here, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dave Clive from uh, the Dave Clive Gretsch Museum uh, is sending his love. Um, wow. My love to you. <laughs> Joe Morgolo saying, hey, Steve, hey, ba yeah. um, Steve Balgoyan loved Stanton's um, tribute to you, and uh, he's enjoying the show. Kelly Ray Tubbs oh. saying that she's happy to catch a little of the show tonight. Kelly Ray Tubbs was on my show, too. She's a, a really fine drummer and a music historian, um, so she knows all the wow. history. Rob Glick, my, uh, my bass player extraordinaire, is in here. Uh, Gary Weiss, as I told you, who plays with Gloria Gaynor, he said that he thinks of you every time that he has to play I Will Survive. <laughs> you know, that was a... Uh, we did that one take real quick. Uh, what was wow. happening with that uh, song was we were working on a, a, another song all day. That I Will Survive, I think that was going to be the B-side. And we were working all day. The record, uh, Freddie Perrin was talking back and forth. The record company was in New York, and we, we were out here cutting. And all day we worked on this first song. I mean, they changed it and they did all different kinds of things. So I think we was there from about 10 to 4. Oh, man. And Fred, hey, man, just do this one thing for me before you leave. And, uh, go see, you know, we usually did that with, with him. We usually play with a click. Right. So he didn't even, because they figured, hey, man, this is a B-side. So it ain't going to, you know, ain't going to be no big thing. He said, in fact, I'll put the the, the uh, intro on there, you know, the, the the piano intro, that beautiful piano intro. So he counted it off, and we played it. He said, "Thank you, gentlemen." 
three weeks later, man, I'm, <laughs> you know, it was happening. You know, I looked up and it was happening. A lot of the time when you were cutting those those tracks, there were no vocal on there, right? So no, most of the times, most most of the times when there was no vocal or no scratch vocal, even right. Oh, not even a scratch vocal. Yeah, yeah. So you guys were just laying down that rhythm section stuff on that. We laid it down, yeah. No idea what it was going to be, and then boom, it's this massive hit. <laughs> Most of the times, no idea what it was going to be. It, you know, every so often we might do a cover, and I kind of knew. But, I mean, 99% of the time, we, we had no idea. I Bernard Purdy was saying that, like, sometimes he didn't even know what the tune was that he played on. You know, and and wasn't even sure that it was him later on because sometimes the, they would just kind of um, shelf some of these things, do a bunch of these recordings, and then they would show up later with with a vocal on them, and he wasn't even sure what you know what he was on. You know, I, yeah, that's crazy. Wow, well, that's, I I understand that. I, I same thing with me. A lot of times I didn't know it was me. You know, if they wrote something out. You know, because at Motown, they wrote out everything, the open and close hi-hats, what symbols you hit, what toms you hit. They wrote it all out. Oh, like every detail was there. Every detail. Wow. They wrote it. I know they didn't do that in Detroit, but they did it in Los Angeles. You know? Yeah, yeah. And so you so, you really had to get your reading game on quick. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Man, uh, did you did you basically teach yourself to read, or did you find somebody and say, like, hey, man, like I got to get this reading thing together? I I got some books, some rhythm books, and I, I just basically basically taught myself. Wow. Yeah, that's impressive, yeah. man. I still need a teacher. I mean, you never learn it all. You know? Yeah, you can't learn it all. That is for sure. You know, but I mean, there's some things that I'd like to, uh, you know, a lot of, I, I played on some big band albums, but I, I don't think I'm, um, you know, that qualified. I'd like to, you know, learn that. Yeah, yeah. You know? Hey man, it's you know it's good to to just keep that process of learning. Like I think I think drummers, um, especially drummers, like we're sort of lifelong students of the instrument, you know, because there's just so much to absorb, man. And I think we we appreciate that as musicians. I mean, that's right. what I take. Um, and by the way, the one one thing I wanted to mention a while back is you you were talking about singing, and um, my feeling is that drummers that can sing understand being a drummer better than those of us that can't sing because and i think we learn it we learn it vicariously through watching singers and learning but if you're a singer to begin with what you bring to the table is going to be more sympathetic to the vocal and everything else that's going on in the music more so that's i think that's very true you know very true you know you know, now when I would get to do recordings that I knew that I was going to be playing for a certain artist, I, you know, if I had never played with them, I'd listen to their records. Right, right. And figure out how I would lay that pocket for them. Mm -hmm. You know, and because by me being a singer too, I know how you want it to feel. You know, yeah. some people like laid back, and some people like, you know, a thrust. Yeah. So yeah, it is. It, it is a an, an advantage, definitely an advantage, definitely yeah, an sure. advantage. Yes. I I will ask you know when I'm working for a songwriter, I'll get the lyrics, um, and and also try to connect to the lyrics. I'll read the lyrics, like if you know, especially you're playing with their scratch track, their scratch vocal. I want to know what they're saying to try to make that connection. Do you do that? Do you get the lyrics? Uh well, I, I I didn't necessarily get the lyrics. What I would do is I would try to find out who who it was, and if they had anything that I could listen to, I would listen to them to try to figure out how they phrase certain things. Yeah, yeah. You know, or about. And uh, that, in fact, I I would even do that, like I did an album with a guy named Steve uh, Wilkerson. He uh, had Joy D. Francesco yeah. to play his record. And so I listened to Joy, yeah. you know, before I did the uh, the record with him. You know, I would always you know, I'd try to do my homework, you know, as they call it. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I'm, you know I, I, take, I really take this stuff serious. 
you know, I really, you know, it's, it's a serious thing for me, you know, so. And it shows, <laughs> it shows you bring, you bring it to the table every single time. Um, Gary is asking if you, how you feel when you hear things on the radio now or on TV where you're playing on it. Do you still get like that feeling of like, oh, wow. Well, you know, you hear stuff that you, <laughs> it might be all right. Sometimes you hear stuff, you know, I could have done that better right there at ball four or something, something like that. I mean, you know, if it's, if it's been a long time when I hear it and I said, wow, man, I played that. That's great. You know, that's, that's wonderful. But a lot of times I would be hard on, on myself. You know, sometimes the record would be successful, and I, and I figured I didn't do exactly everything that it, that I should have done. You know, and um, it would kind of bother me. You know, it bothered me. It would bother me. Aren't we our own worst enemies? <laughs> you, like, you play something, and then you'll you'll go back and hear it, and you'll be like, "Oh man, you know what I would have played instead of that." <laughs> you start rethinking it. You know. Meanwhile, right. the things that it's you know with with some of these songs, there are these huge hits. And every drummer on the planet would would say, "Don't ever change that." They love what you did. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, I, I'll also say that uh, Dan Traglia, a good friend of mine from, um, he's a New Jersey drummer, great drummer. He said that you're playing on the live at Carnegie Hall. Bill, Bill Withers live at Carnegie Hall record is legendary, um, and what an incredible rhythm section! And thank you for all the inspiration. Wow, uh, so thank you for enjoying it. At that time, see, we had been, the rhythm section had been with the Watts 103rd Street Rhythm Band. Right. So we had been playing together for a while. And we kind of knew each other. We knew each other. So the Carnegie Hall, if you notice the temples, Bill, he, he was a great storyteller. Yeah. And he would put the temples like, use me, was very, was much slower. I don't think we did kiss him all over on that. We might have. I don't know. I can't remember. But um, we were so in tune with one another that we could make it happen at whatever tempo that he, you know, that he would uh, start at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, so, I, when, you were, when you were playing tunes at, at a different tempo like that, was there any kind of, like... You guys played together so long, I'm sure there was no resistance from anybody. Did everybody just kind of fall into those other temples? Everybody fell in, and they were able to, uh, I mean, you know, you have to, uh, I don't what, what word would I use? You know, you know, your mind, you get ready for it. Yeah, yeah. And I was able, you get able to, uh, you know, perform, you know, at that tempo yeah you know yeah. this a drummer because it, it, the stuff was slower yeah yeah it, and it usually was it's tricky like when you get a song really stuck in your head at the tempo that you played it at right it's hard to to take that into a different place you know you still feel that connection to that where where it felt right at the time you know right well the the thing that probably made it uh more comparable for us was that he had his guitar. He played his guitar. Right, right. Play the he played. He would play a rhythm, and sometimes the rhythm might not be righteous, but a glimpse of it. I guess I'll use that word. We, you know, I I would know where the pulse was. Yeah. Because I'd worked with him so long. Right. Um, you know, we, we we were able to pull it off like that because a lot of times, you know, it was called if he was a little tired or. Or whatever it was, you know, how he felt. Just like, you know, just like if you play some jazz sometimes. I mean, whatever, you know, it's uh, however, like when I worked with Eddie Harris uh, and I was playing, he would play fusion. I played some funk with him, but I played a lot of fusion with him. And some nights he would just we would come down. I mean, it would be that fast. Wow. You know, and then some nights he would just, you know. But, you know, in R&B, you got to you got to lock and you got to have some kind of pulse. You got to have a groove. So yeah. we were able to, uh, you know, it was it was it was a great time in playing with one another. We were able to uh, make it, you know, comparable, make it feel right. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, 
Lucia Seminar, my student, is asking, what is, by the way, she's like 12 years old. <laughs> she's saying, what is your favorite track that you've played on? Wow. You know, I really could. People ask me that and I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I really don't know. I mean, I just, you know, I'm just enjoying playing all of them. But, hey, man, they got a girl. I guess she's from London. Is she, what, 10 years old now? She was seven years old. Oh, man, man, I heard I, the young people, man, they, they are really catching on to this stuff. Yeah. This little girl had pigtails on and she played Use Me, man. And it felt so great, man. I was just amazed. I said, I want to meet her. <laughs> wow. She played some other stuff. She, she played some great rock stuff. But she played Use Me one day. And I said, man, she got the feel. She understood, you know. You're talking about Nandy, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nandy worked so, on a, a project with Dom recently. Right. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I look, I look. You know, it's, it's it's wonderful for the to see the perception of these young people. Yeah. You know, that understand that. You know. Yep. Because they'll they'll make you understand what you don't. <laughs> oh my God! Oh, yeah. That's what it's supposed to be. I mean, you know. So that it's 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 just wonderful. Daniel. You know, Daniel. Wonderful. Um, Daniel Glass and I were talking about how, like, you know, when when we were learning and, and coming up, you had to take the record and slow down the record player or, you know, stop, put the needle back again, listen, put the needle back. Kids now, man, they got right. all these tools. They can break everything down. There's there's all this stuff at their fingertips, man, and they're just absorbing everything. Man, they got it together. I mean, they can go on YouTube and watch. They can watch this stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Amazing how they're able to, uh, you know, grasp all these things at an early age like that. It's, it's remarkable, you know. Chris Lesso, another great drummer, he's asking, um, he said, what an honor to, to hear you tonight. And he said, what was your biggest confidence booster when you started working with, like, these high-caliber legends? Like, where, where did you have to go to to get that, that confidence to pull it together? I'm a Christian. Yeah. You know, not even God Almighty. Jesus Christ is my Savior. Yeah. And uh, I was in Motown one day. And I had, I have started, they had started calling me every day. And I looked up, I said, man, I have arrived. Thank God. You know, and, and uh, I was, I said, man, I, 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 I did it, you know, because I had when I came to California, I had no idea about any stu of what a studio musician was. Right. You know, bands that came through town. I'm from Kansas City, the Midwest. We thought all the bands played on the records. Yeah, but we didn't know about studio musicians. So when I got out here, and I was so glad that I said, "Man, this is what I want. I want to try to be a studio musician because." The tours that I had been on was traveling in a station wagon all across the country, man. <laughs> you know, sometimes the gigs didn't pay something, you know. So this this was, man. I said, "Wow, they got something like this. This is great. I'm I, I'm I, I'm going to try to, you know, to do this." So I had a rhyme. So it was it was it was a blessing. It was a blessing. And you had to, uh, you know, going from that history and then learning how to play with a click. And getting in these studios and starting to record, you know, that must have been a whole learning process, right? Yes, it was a learning process, but I was um, determined. I guess you would use that word. I said, hey, man, if they got, you know, the click, I mean, <laughs> that was very hard. The thing about it, you know, you have to let the click be the click. You can't fight the click. You got to let it be what it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know that at first. You know, you try to force your thing. Into it, but then you know, I, you guys, I say, I got, I got to make this work. Yeah, I got. To. So, what I would do is, see, one, one is so big. A lot of people don't know one is so big, man. One is big, and everybody plays on the one different. Right. I mean, you playing with a lot of people without a click, then it's a, it's 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 altogether different than playing with a click. Yeah. So when I would play with the click, I would the click. Would, I'd have to turn the click up a lot of times where I would hear the click more so than I'd hear anybody else. And so I would play with the click and, you know, and read the music. Yeah. 
So that that worked for me, you know, because a lot of times if you if you're trying to listen to the click and you're listening to the keyboard player or the bass player, uh, everybody's not playing on the click like you play on it. It right. can be devastating. Yeah, you yeah. know, you know, it's, it's it can be very tricky. You know. By the way, I wanted to mention real quick, um, Tommy Igo. Um, he didn't have a chance to shoot a video, but he said um, he said that he's a huge fan. And he has been forever. And he, in Groove Essentials, his book, he dedicated Groove number 14, which is the R&B section, to you. And it's all about... Oh, yeah, yeah. So he's channeling your groove on uh, in his book under the R&B section. And, um, and he's saying that uh, he doesn't know if, you know, if, um, if everybody's making that musical connection, but there's... Um, that's what that's all about. And he says that there's um, there's one video that he shows every single student who comes to the studio, and that is you performing with Bill Withers, uh, which in his opinion is the quintessential example of how to play this instrument and truly serve the song. And he said, thank you so much, Maestro Gadsden. So that was from Tommy Igo. Uh, what a compliment. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, he texted thank that to me. And he also texted um, a question. So he said... Um, he said his question concerns your left hand playing traditional grip and your signature snap backbeat. And he said, do you have anything to share with us on how you get what he calls the Gadsden snap? Well, you know, uh, man, I, I'm playing not like I'm not playing traditional now unless I'm playing some jazz. Right, right. And what happened was when I got with Motown, they didn't like the traditionals. They said, man, you're not hitting it hard enough. Huh. And so I was determined to, to be there. You know, I was determined to be there. And so I started playing, uh, you know, the other way and not traditional grip. So you started playing and matched at I, Motown? Yeah. I have to, oh. and, 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 you know, I have to practice. I have to practice traditional grip now. And, you know, the good thing about traditional grip is it's, uh, you can uh it's you can do more with with that yeah then you you can you know with that power thing that's what this is a power thing they like that snare sound that's what that's why i got that so i mean so that uh that's what happened with me with that yeah yeah what you know I, it's funny because what tommy's talking about you know you see it on the video when you're doing kiss of my love he's tommy my, tommy was saying that you dead stroke the backbeat where you leave it on the head on that tune. And, uh, and it gets a specific sound, right? Um, right. It gets like such a unique sound. So Tommy was saying that he loves that, that uh, feel and uh, in your time playing. So it's like just the way you were uh, snapping it and then leaving it on the head produced a right. specific thing, man. That was, yeah, really, really great. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, a lot of that is from the uh, jazz item too. I mean, you know, when we playing the jazz stuff, I mean, it's more, uh, how would I use uh, the word, uh, you know, it's not just, it's not just up and down, you know, you're doing, it's, it's, oh man, I can't think of the word right now, but uh, you, 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 more, you have uh, in a way more expression. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. For and, I think the finesse comes out more in traditional grip. Right. Yeah, it's much more for finesse where if I'm playing the R&B thing, yeah, I'll play it, then uh, you there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're here. If, man. I'm, if I'm playing the R&B thing, then it's just a, a, it's a, it's a, they want a constant groove. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so with, with the jazz thing, I'm, I'm doing more expressive stuff. I'm like painting, you know. Right. And so that, uh, that's what that's about. Um, I was going to read one more thing here. Oh, <laughs> my student Jonathan Schneider is hanging out. He's supposed to be doing college work. He's studying music at uh, City College with Carl Allen, uh, who's a great jazz drummer. Uh, yes, he with, with Winton and everybody. And uh, he said he's supposed to be doing homework, but he's watching this because because uh, you're on. And um, he asked, how has your technique changed as you've gotten older over the years? Well, you know, arthritis is starting to sit in. 
So um, you have to uh, figure out how to uh, compensate. Yeah. I mean, I do because I'm, you know, I'm starting to uh, get arthritis, God. and uh, so I just try to, you know, I, I, you know, practicing really helps you, and so I try to keep up. You know, I try to practice a certain amount as much as I can. Uh, to try to uh, stay fluent, fluid, uh, yeah. you know, so that's for me, that's that for me, that's what, that's what it would be. Nice. You know, do you take students? Do you, do you ever um, teach anybody? I have, I, I, I don't have a steady flow of students because I'm not a teacher. Right. Right. But what I, what happens is a lot of times I will get every so often somebody wants to learn a certain well, they want to learn what they figure is my my technique. Right, right. Man, learn how to groove. Well, you know, everybody's got a different groove. Yeah. But I, you know, ever so, I mean, I've had students that, from different parts of the world, which is, uh, you know, man, I was just taken back. The people would fly over to study with me because they would want to learn these this different. Uh, way that I play these different rhythms and stuff. Yeah. So I, you know, every so often I uh, have a student I teach, you know. I mean, I would, I would think that people would want, you know, some drummers, even really experienced drummers, would want to just get with you to talk about groove and to talk about the approach. Because, like you said, everybody's groove is different, but getting the, the view through your lens of of how you bring what you bring to the table, you know that's that's priceless, man. You know to get to get well, that. You know, I, that I would talk to that, that I way that I teach that uh, is uh, you have to be relaxed and you have to be uh, what word would, would, would I would use for that? You know, you you got to be sure of yourself. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can, you know, you have to. So, in order to master that, I mean, a lot of it's got to do with your mind. You know, a lot of it's got to do with your mind. So, you have to, um, you got to relax and say, "Do you, you know, until you get this down." Yeah. And uh, I, what what I teach is, when whatever rhythms or approaches that I would teach, I would teach them very slow until a person would get the uh, feeling of it to where they can control it. And then if you can control it, then you're putting, once you can put yourself in this, then you're going to groove this. You're going to make a groove. People is going to feel that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's, that's how I, that's how I would, that's how I do it, yeah. you know, and then, and it's worked for some, you know, some, you know, some people it, it worked. Yeah, man. Um, how would somebody get in touch with you? Like if they wanted to do a lesson, well, just uh, email me. Right. You know, email me, gjym at aol.com. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know what? I'll put I'll put a link to that in um in the video, okay. when the video posts. Um, so I, I wanted to, because we, we talked a bunch about, about the Bill Withers stuff, but like, um, and and I mentioned Beck earlier, which, which I, you know, I, I love that stuff, like I said, just because it's a departure, you know, it's kind of, it's interesting to hear. Um, you've also worked with some like big singers, um, you know, throughout the seventies, like Barbara Streisand, like those kind of gigs, man, getting those kind of calls. Wow. wow that was a, you know, it was, it was an honor and a pleasure to work with her. Yeah. I, mean, I didn't play any orchestra, orchestra. It was a disco. Yeah. I think I did stuff with her a couple of times, but I mean, this, for me to be in the same, hey man, Barbara Streisand, um, and she was very gracious, and 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 she can, you know, I mean, she's very uh, picky about what she wants. Yeah, you know, so it, I mean, it, it it was fine, you know, because it was a disco thing that I got to do with her, and um, yeah, it was that record, Wet, right? That disco album. Yeah, and it and it worked. Yeah, you yeah. know. 
And, you know, she got a hit off of it, and, you know, she sent me a bottle of champagne. I thought that was awful nice of her. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's cool. Was She yeah. was in, the, in on the session? Was she there? She was there. Now, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember. You know, I did Barbara Streisand, and uh, it's the lady's name is saying, Love to Love You, Baby. Uh, uh... The big dis- shit, a lot of disco stuff. She, um, uh, man. Sherilyn? No. Uh, love to love you, baby. And, uh, oh, oh um, somebody in the chat. What's, what? Donna Summer. Donna Summer, yeah, yeah. They did an album together. They did some disco records together. So I can't, I know they were there together. Wow. At the same time. And the respect was wonderful. You know, everybody was respecting one another, and it and it, and it turned, worked out one. Yeah, yeah. Holy. Oh, so, um, it you know she you know if she it was it was it was wonderful. It was gracious. Awesome. You know, you know. I mean, I was in all. Yeah. You know, first place. You know, so I will. I want to make sure I did my best. You know. What about uh, Aretha Franklin? Uh, that was I was I didn't I I played some some records with her, but I don't they were I don't think they were big successful records. Yeah. Um, uh, it was fine. I I wish that I had played with her when she played the piano. Yeah. To get to get the, the 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 you know the thing that she got that she portrays you know, but I mean you know I'm, you know she's a fan she was fantastic I mean Aretha Franklin was a hey man she could sing anything she's a powerhouse <laughs> yeah she could sing anything jazz I mean I heard her, when I heard her sing the standards I I dug the standards just you know but uh, if I uh, for, you know for me to I would have enjoyed working with her where she played the piano yeah yeah oh i mean it's it's just incredible the amount of the amount of folks that you've worked with i mean but oh you know what's something i wanted to ask you earlier um so did you come to know how blaine living in l.a yeah and, yeah, yeah so yeah. Hal blaine Hal blaine uh what a wonderful gentleman he uh when I was with the Watson 103rd Street Rhythm Band, I had my drums were awful. You know, I mean, before I was able to uh, get some new drums. Right. He left his drums in the studio for me to play. Oh, wow. It was a song called 65 Bars and a Taste of Soul that I played with the Watson 103rd Street Rhythm Band. And he had all these Tom Toms. I had never seen anything like that before. <laughs> you like eight of them, right? So the guy said, hey, man, you know, Hal Blaine left these here. You better play all these drums. <laughs> I got to play all of them. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, he was playing and, that big Octoplus kit. Well, just, you know, we've been in each other's company. I, I enjoyed him immensely. Beautiful. Oh and uh, and you came to know Earl Palmer? Yes, Earl Palmer also. Also very gracious. You know, wonderful people. I mean. You know, he, I, you know, I looked up one night. I was playing a gig, and he was there. So I really got nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Man, come on over and have a drink. You know, beautiful, beautiful cats. I mean, these cats. I mean, they they paved the way for for me. You know, I mean, and uh, and those two gentlemen. Not only just they did the R and B and the pop. They did all. They did everything. Yeah. You know, TV and the movies and all that. I done, I did, I didn't do as, a lot of TV and a lot of movies. But man, those guys were all around fantastic musicians. You know, wonderful. And um, and I just wanted to mention because we talked about this um when we were hanging earlier that I got my modern drummer out from 2007, and um, uh, Jim Keltner mentions playing with you on um on Joe Cocker record and he was playing percussion. You were playing drums, right? And, right. um, he's just paying, you know, the greatest respect to you on that. And how is that getting to play with, with Keltner in that kind of situation and getting to know him? 
I was in awe because, you know, I had heard some records. I didn't know it was him. I used to, I would listen to him and try to do certain things that he did. Then I finally met him. And, uh, man, we did this session with, uh, oh, it was great, man. It was just, I, I was in awe the whole time I was there with him, you know. Well, he's he's basically saying he was in awe of you. So getting to watch you work in person, he said, was magical. Wow. <laughs> See, man. Well, man, I mean, you know, he was, so, I mean, he made, he was so cool that I, I you know, I was in awe, but after a while, he made me, you know, I could relax around him. Yeah, yeah. He was cool, man. Beautiful. He's good, good. We talk a lot. We talk. Well, we don't talk a lot, but we talk, you know. And so, uh, you know, just great, man. You know, it's so many wonderful. I've been so blessed to uh, have met so many wonderful drummers and so many wonderful musicians. You know, it's just, it's, you know, it's a blessing. You know, I, I, uh, I am, I'm, I am, I am still in all, you know, and, uh, I was saying, I, just, I always feel like I, drummers are some weird, crazy extended family. Like we're just this family, like, uh, dysfunctional family across the world that all kind of comes together. Like no right. other musicians, you know, it's like. Drummer. I, uh, you know, I, um, uh, I was just aspiring to be a singer. Yeah. That's what I, that's what my thing was. I was going to, that's what I really, I mean, I, drumming was second, Derry. And, uh, what happened to me out here as a singer, you know, that, uh, I, I don't want to go for a long thing and mention that that was, uh, derogatory it turned me off yeah, yeah you know you want to sing i didn't even sing for about 10 years oh really i stayed horse for i stayed horse for two years yeah so um uh, you know that i guess it, it it wasn't my calling i guess i have to you know sit look at it like that you know but do, but, uh, do you still sing just for you i mean do you still enjoy well singing? if you know on the gigs I go on the gigs. I mean, I haven't gigged in two years, though. Since the pandemic, uh, I've done some sessions. Yeah, yeah. In the year. But I have COPD and asthma, and I've had cancer for 21 years, although it's in remission. So oh, I have okay. to be very careful out there. So a lot of, a lot of my uh, accounts that were in different parts of the country, I uh, didn't get to do them, you know. Uh and I had, I have a, it's a club that the gentleman that's a good friend of mine, guitar player that he's rebuilding and I work with him and uh, I'm looking forward to that. I love to play and sing, you know, and, uh, I, and then, so I said, well, on, on that gig, I sing, a lot, you know, are you singing harmonies or are you singing, um, lead vocals on stuff? Lead, we, lead, we all, you know, the last, uh, before you know the pandemic closed down and we lost the uh, organist, he passed away. Famous, famous organist. Uh, man, it, it hurts me to my heart to think. Mike, Michael Finnegan. He played with Jimmy Hendrix. Everybody, you oh know. My God. He was a fa fantastic singer. Bill Lynch, fantastic singer. I sang, and then Abraham Laborio was going to sing. Wow. You know, so I was singing, and we were singing harmony parts and stuff. So it was, it was great. You know, just musicians. You know, we were we was doing the thing. You know. Oh man! All right, I got some um, I got some speed round questions, like really simple questions. So, um, first show you ever saw where you were seeing music, and and that really got you looking to do this. Oh, um, besides your well, brother, <laughs> I mean, you know, the singing thing started when I was very young, but the drumming thing was, um, uh, Idris Mohammed. Wow. His name, his name was Leo Morrison at the time. And he was playing with, uh, 
on R&B a gentleman by the name of Jerry Butler. I think he played with Curtis Mayfield and Jerry Butler. Yeah. So they came to Kansas City with Jerry Butler one night. And I had never heard that kind of groove and that style of drumming like that. In fact, everybody moved. <laughs> it was so great that everybody moved from the front to the side to, to watch the drummer and listen to the drummer. Oh you know, that's what made me uh, really, you know, to, you know, dial in on, you know, being really get serious about being a drummer. You know, wow. I heard. And then later on, I found out he played on a, before he played on a lot of other stuff. He played on a lot of earlier Chicago stuff, uh, a lot of Curtis Mayfield stuff, you know. And, uh, you know, I, later on I found out, you know, that was him. Wow. Yeah, he, he uh, when I heard, when I heard him, uh, I mean, I, I loved uh, all the great drummers, uh, Gene Cooper and... Uh, Buddy Rich. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I would see them. But at that time, I was, you know, it, 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 the drum thing didn't really occur to me. I was singing, you know, I was, I was thinking about a singing thing. So that's, I, you know, I would check them out. You know, I was very, you know, I was into the music, but it didn't occur to me like that. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, you know. Man. How about first the first big gig that you did where you were like, "Holy moly, this is it! I'm I'm here! I've I've made it." Uh, I guess that was with uh, Bill Withers. Yeah. You know, I mean, I did. I mean, I was playing with the Watts on the Surgery Rhythm Band with the Temptations, and I sang, but I didn't feel. That's comfortable. Even and then I wasn't saying Bill did all, you know, Bill was singing, it was his show. Yeah. But I guess that one when I got, you know, and, and the records took off. Yeah. And that's 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 when I felt I said, man, you know, something has happened here. You know. Amazing. What about who's a drummer that might inspire you today? Man, they got so many guys, man. Oh my goodness! Woo! I mean, there's so there's so much young, great talent out there, man. You know, I mean, oh my goodness! I mean, there's so many guys now. Yeah. That I, uh, mm. And I, I mentioned, you know, some of the guys that well, like uh, Chris Dave. I mean, I, you know, I mean, there's so many. Uh, the guy who plays with Dave Grohl. I mean, this oh, yeah, man. Yeah, Taylor Hawkins. Um, and I mentioned Daru Jones before because Daru is doing like a different thing, Darryl. right? I met him in Nashville. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did a, a double drum thing one time. Nice. With a, a country singer. Uh, he's fantastic. He's fantastic, too. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, and then it's. My goodness, I don't know who it's, it's. You know, it's it's like picking flowers. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, there's a lot of great players, and 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 you and, know, and great players. And there's always something new to learn, right? Yeah. Um, nice. Uh, I'm gonna mention just a couple other drummers and just see like reactions. You know what's funny? I, I got to show you this. Well, no one's gonna be able to read this. I don't think, but this is like, it's it's hard to see. Um, but your name is on this list. Of everybody that I interview, I go down this list, and you're right there in the middle under Steve Ferroni. Um, wow. And and I, I'm always like, I just yell out names of drummers to get reactions, you know? Um, but the first drummer on the list is Tony Williams. Wow. You got any um, any first reactions when you hear the name Tony Williams? Well, I mean, he was so... Uh, by that time... I had gotten into R and B, right? And um, I mean, it was it was amazing what he was doing. 
you know, I, and I, 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 uh, I said, man, I ain't, I ain't never seen nobody do this. But uh, I had gotten into R and B, so my mind was going in another direction. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Billy Joe Jones, yeah. Before then, you know. Yep. So uh, you know, Tony Williams was great. I mean, it's it just that I was, I was trying to learn. A lot of people don't know how deep, how deep R and B is. Yeah. It ain't, it ain't no joke. You know, it's a lot of, a lot of valleys and. You know, it's a it's a whole other thing. That it is know. indeed. What about um, Sigaboo? Wow, man! When I heard him, I mean, he, I heard that sister struck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. You know, we we become good friends, and I had I had to go see him. I mean, I was so taken. Hey, well, now he's that's now that's funk. That's that's the funk. Yeah, yeah. But I had to go see him to see what see how he was playing this, playing it, this different stuff, and it was altogether different than what I thought. I mean, I'm trying. I said, well, I'm gonna play this like Zigaboo. Hey, man, I, it was altogether different. <laughs> yeah, it's such a crazy thing, you know the 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 way that he's sticking that, and he's really right. sticking it like a second line. Approach. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's so it's so amazing. Right. Um what about uh Clyde Stubblefield and uh Jabo? I never got to see them in person. Well I might it might have been far off when I was out with James Brown. Yeah. But I mean I, I loved what what they did. I mean, because I think the first uh record that I made that was a hit, I it was it was you know, the James Brown thing I did this record called Fuck It Walk. Right. And I was trying I was trying to mimic what they were doing. Yeah. You know, uh, so it was great. I mean James Brown had a drummer named Clayton Filliard. Yeah, yeah. Was before them. And I mean I, I got to see him too. I mean he had a he had a whole other thing happening too. You know, so I mean you got all this going on. You know, and so I'm a mixture of it, you know. It's amazing how, like, each guy that played with James Brown brought something totally unique to the table. Yep. Right. Yeah, bro. totally different. Like Melvin Parker, it was, like, stripped down real straight. Right. And Clayton Phillips. Melvin Lattis. Parker was fantastic. He was fantastic, too. I played I play with Maceo. I went on the road with them for a couple of months. Oh, wow. I took Melvin's place because Melvin would play with them sometimes. He would come out and play with them. How was that playing with Maceo? Oh man, it was uh, it was funky. Yeah. I mean, my socks would sweat. <laughs> my socks, you know. Uh. In that room, you know, I, I had a good time. Nice. And Fred Wesley, uh, I had met him when he got out of college. With you know, when I was with Hank Ballard and the Midnighters. Yeah. So I knew him and Pee Wee Ellis. I met Pee Wee Ellis when I stayed in Miami before he got with James Brown. You know, he was playing uh, Train and Train and Miles, you know, playing playing that before he got with James Brown. He wasn't playing, right? you know. And so I met him. So I, it was kind of like, except I didn't know Maceo. So it was, it was, it was pretty cool. Wow. You know. Yeah, man. Um, I'll just mention uh, one other guy, Steve Gadd. Wow, man! Now that's now that's that's some technique. And, you know, he's wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. But he's another guy too, man. Just like you, that he plays for the song. So, like, you know, it's man. he's not gonna he's not gonna put anything extra on it if it doesn't ask for it. It's not asking you for it, you know. But he's played in so many EDMs too. Right, right. So many different yeah. styles, right? I mean, play, man, uh, oh my goodness, you know. I, so many things he played on that uh you know, it's just it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, you know, and, uh, you know, he played uh I don't think he remembered. I asked him about well, I mean, there's a lot of things that he played on um but I think he he played. They have his name on a song called "Walk Away from Love," 
David Ruffin did. Well, he's playing that Tom thing. He got that Tom, that Sama thing going. Okay. Asked him about that. He said he didn't play, but they got his name on this. And it sounded like him, so it had to be him. But uh, man, he's he's played so he's played so many different. Uh, you know, he he can scope out and make it so sophisticated. Yeah. yeah. You know, on a lot of different things. He's fantastic, fantastic gentleman. Cool. Um, so. As far as a non-drummer, who would be a non-drummer that inspires you now, today? A non-drummer? A non-drummer. Could be a musician, could be not not even a musician. Who's somebody that you find inspiration from today? Hmm. Well, it's a producer that uh, I find to be very... He says he doesn't know anything about music. But I think he 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 he, he knows uh, much more than what he says he does, uh, you know. Um, and he so he uh, and, uh, um, old age is a book of them. His name he's the biggest producer in the world. Uh, uh, man, somebody you're working with now? Well, I haven't worked with him lately. Oh, okay, okay. But I did. Uh, I did have some Harry Styles for him, and uh, oh, okay, and uh, some other stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but he, 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 you know, he comes in the studio and uh, relaxes, lays down, totally relaxes, and uh, say he don't know nothing about music. He just know how I'm supposed to feel. <laughs> wow, Rick Rubin. Oh yeah, yeah. Man. Yeah, man. Ever seen, you know, Rick Rubin and uh, Don was is a bass player. And he's fantastic. The way, and you know, because I think he was a, I think he was a jazz bassist in college. Um, you know, the concepts that, that he has is fantastic. He's a, he understands a lot of different kind of music. Wow. You know, I, I enjoy those guys. You know what? Uh, um, that's amazing. I mean, Nigel, Nigel, who was a producer engineer, fantastic, fantastic. I mean, hands on, one of the most hands on producers that I've, 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 that I've ever worked with. Wow, just fantastic. You know, that that kind of I, um, give and take is is nice in the studio, right? Like if if uh, right. if they're very involved and and just looking for what you bring to the table and then bringing their ideas to the table. More of a conversation, right? Right. Yeah, man. Oh, man. Well, man, I have to say this has been an amazing time spending with you and uh, talking music, talking drums. Okay. Don't let me forget. I don't, you know, forget the uh, Norman Whitfields at the Motown and the Hal Davises and the uh, Frank Wilsons and people of that nature. Yeah. They were wonderful teachers for me too, you know. As I uh, was able to, uh, you know, go through this journey, yeah. You know, I mean, all these different, all these different fantastic. You know, I, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. Yeah, and I mean, I'm still discovering stuff that you've played on, <laughs> and I, I printed out. I printed out your your entire sort of discography and um and I was even kind of amazed to find out that um you did a bunch of, of Nashville guys so like you know in recent years Keith Urban um Kelly Clarkson uh, yeah. and uh Leanne Rhymes right so right. like working with with some of those folks and, and I'm I'm just looking going like man you're just still doing it still doing it it's a beautiful. Oh, it's, it's a it's it has been a, a wonderful journey. It's been a wonderful blessing, you know. I mean, I I uh, all praises to God Almighty because you know I, I I'm self taught, and a lot of people you know they uh had training, you know, from different people, 
So it's, it's a, it, you know, mine is a blessing, even though my father was a drummer, but he, he didn't teach me nothing. He, <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't want me to be in the music business. God bless him. God rest his soul. Yeah. You know, um, man, I, you know, it's, I, I'm, I am amazed at the journey that I've been through. You know, I don't, t- I, 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 and I don't take it for granted. I'm just, I just feel blessed. I really do. Well, we're blessed to to have you telling us your story, just being here with us, telling us uh, your story. And I think, you know, that that's why I do these podcasts, because I just want to capture people's stories, man. And it's it's really about the man behind the drums, you know. Um, we could, you know, everybody ask about the same grooves and stuff, but, but I want to know... I, I'm interested in the man behind it and, and your journey, you know, so I feel so appreciative that you took the time and you were so generous with your time to hang and talk oh, man, about all this I, stuff. I enjoyed it immensely. And man, I'm just so, um, oh, I don't know the word just taken back from the people that appreciate the, you know, the work that I've done. I mean, that just, it, may, it makes me really feel, gracious you know that's that's just wonderful i mean i just i don't you know what can i say i mean it's it's beautiful it's beautiful and uh everybody thank you everybody that was tuning in tonight and and listening to our conversation i really appreciate it um everybody was showing so much love tonight it's uh it's a beautiful thing and um i'm sure maybe one day we'll do it again and if i'm on the west coast i'm gonna find you and take you out for dinner (laughs) yeah i'm gonna get it at lunch (laughs) yeah yeah. Maybe maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll make a, a date. Me, you, and uh, Garibaldi will go out and and get man, it. that would be that would be great, man. Because I it'd be great to spend some time with him. Yeah. Because last time I saw him, he came in the club while I was playing. That's where he heard those shuffles at. You know. Right. Right. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. We get- they, they, one time before they, you know, they was playing shuffles. Before, New Orleans might have been playing a different. Rhythm, but you know, a lot of times I came up on the blues right. and the shuffles, you know, and so um, a shuffle is a shuffle. It's, it's so many ways. That's the thing about it, you know. He he was wanting to know. There's so many ways you can play a shuffle. The idea is knowing the rhythm and making it shuffle. Right. That's that's what it is. You know. You know, I was thinking about that this morning, like before we get wrapped up. I was thinking about when I because. David was like, oh, man, make sure you talk about shuffles. And I was I feel like the shuffle is the one groove that can really define where a drummer's been and where he's going. You know, that's right, because it's it's not like other grooves. It's it has history in it that that I think goes deeper and it has a certain feeling that reveals where you've been and and it's a type of groove where it always feels like you're going somewhere and so i was like man the shuffle is that groove that reveals where you've been and where you're going i don't know i don't know if that's deep or silly or but that's what i was feeling this morning i think i think every drummer i think every drummer should learn how to play the shuffle 100 percent. it's all together different from everything else you know James, tilt your camera. I can't see your face. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think every drummer should learn how to play the shuffle. One hundred percent. Right. It's, it's such an important thing, and it's underrated by I think young people today have to really go back. You can't know where you're going unless you know where music is being. You, you have to go back. That's right. That's it, man. All right, my brother. Well, this has been amazing. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here, folks. But um, thank you to everybody for listening. Thank you for David Garibaldi, Ralph Roll, Dom Famularo, Daniel Glass, Stanton Moore, Brian Dunn, Jim Payne for sending those wonderful videos, which I'm gonna send you all those videos, James, so you can have them. Um, what? And uh, it's been really amazing. Thank you, Stanton Moore, for hanging with us tonight, and Dom and uh, Peter Retzlaff and all Gary Groovy and all you wonderful people for hanging with us. And um, we'll see you on the next one, man. Wow. Thank, and thank everybody for enjoying. Because yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it immensely. Thank all you right. so much, guys. We're going to roll here. We'll talk to you real soon. All righty. Roll the titles. Oh.